So ladies and gentlemen, as he comes, once again, I would like to ask you not to just welcome him as he comes to, speech, uh, to speak, but would you also thank him for his great service to our country and our cause. Please welcome Gary Bauer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very nice of you. I appreciate that. Ronald Reagan told me that if I ever speak to an audience and I get a standing ovation, I ought to sit down immediately because there's nowhere to go but down after that. So knowing you all are friends, I'll proceed anyway. Well, look, it is fantastic to be here yet at another year for a Values Voter Summit. I'm always happy to be here, but I have to be honest with you, this year, it really seems to me to be a more significant event than ever. Because I, I'm up here, you can't see the whole audience. I'm looking out on this audience. As I was walking out here, the first thing that came to my mind as I saw you all is that you're Barack Obama's and Nancy Pelosi's and Harry Reid's worst nightmare. You know, in the last 18 months, I, I've been in Washington a long time. You all know that. I was six foot three when I first came here. And, uh, <laughs> I've been here a long time. I've seen all kinds of demonstrations in Washington, D.C. It's always the left, right? They're always in the streets demanding a new government benefit, demanding that you pay for something. But the last 18 months, there's been wave after wave after wave of demonstrations in this city. And it's not the left. It's you. It's middle America pouring into this city. And, and why is that happening? It's happening because this country is in shock about what is being done to our nation. I run into people all the time. They can't believe it. We've watched left-wing politicians in this city pass legislation that they didn't even bother to read, let alone read the Constitution that they took their oath of office on. And I, you know, I, maybe I'm not perfect on political analysis, but I, my sense is the country is sick and tired of being lectured by liberal elites, telling us what we need to drink, what we need to eat, what we need to drive, what we need to say, what we need to believe. They're tired of it. They're tired of uh, massive debt being put on the backs of our children, children not even born yet. They're tired of the Constitution being treated like it was toilet paper of judges trying to redefine marriage, of taxpayers being forced to pay for abortion. The country's watching as homes are lost, dreams crushed, and they're watching why the president, while the president of the United States, the man who said he was going to bring us together, tries to set one class against another in the rawest class warfare, he ought to be ashamed of himself. I had a reporter come in the other day, Gary, why is everybody so angry? What's everybody so upset about? What's all this turmoil? And I said to this gentleman, I said, you know, the last two weeks leading up to last weekend, the anniversary of the ninth year anniversary of the attack on 9-11, if you didn't do anything as a reporter but pay attention to those last two weeks leading up to that anniversary, you would know all you need to know about why there is so much anxiety and anger around the country. You all remember that day. I bet every one of you here could tell me exactly where you were that morning. I was about 70 yards around, away from the, uh, the uh, Pentagon that morning. Unbelievable day, an act of war. And the days that followed that attack, we had all kinds of these elites tell us what the cause of that attack was. 
Well, some of them said it was because of poverty in the Middle East. Others said it was because of social injustice. Or it was because of foreign policy mistakes by the United States and by Israel. None of those things had anything to do with 9-11. None of those things had anything to do with everything we've seen since 9-11. Here's what caused 9-11. 98% of the American people believe this. Almost none of the elites believe it, or if they believe it, they're not willing to say it. The attackers on 9-11 were not created by poverty. They were created by radical Islam. When they got on those planes, they thought they were getting ready to do something that would please Allah. If they weren't Muslim jihadists, they wouldn't have been on the planes. Now, because our elites are so confused about this, the jihadists have come to believe that they're going to win. They look at the leadership in America and they conclude that we're fat and lazy, this country, that we're a civilization in decline, that our best days are over, that we can't produce heroes anymore like we did at Concord Bridge or the fields at Antietam or on the beaches of Normandy. I believe they're wrong. I think young men and women in uniform in Afghanistan and Iraq are proving them wrong every day. But my friends, I understand why this enemy is so confused. Because when they look at America, in fact, when most of the world looks at America, they don't see a shining city upon a hill. That wonderful biblical phrase that the founders used to describe our country. That phrase that Ronald Reagan used over and over again in every political speech. When the world looks at America these days, all too often they see a moral swamp a culture promoting sex and violence. No wonder our enemies think they can defeat us. You know, our founders knew that only a virtuous people could remain free. Haven't we seen the truth of that, whether we looked at Wall Street or the halls of government or in our schools or even in our own families? If we don't have Americans that know reliable standards of right and wrong, there is no amount of government that can solve the problems facing this country. You know, the central idea of America is in the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. Senator Santorum referred to it a number of times. I know you know that paragraph, but I got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the elites of this country reject the heart of that paragraph. And that is the paragraph that defines America. You can't teach American kids about America without teaching them about that paragraph. You know the words, we hold these truths. I see the elites are in shock right there. Truths. There are no truths. That, that's the, every elite in America, I don't care if it's Hollywood elites, political elites, cultural elites, they all reject the idea of truth. They embrace moral relativism. Well, Gary, what's true for you may not be true for somebody else. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by... Yeah, not by the president. Not by the Congress, not by the Supreme Court, endowed by their creator. And by the way, folks, that's not Allah. Endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. It means rights that not only can't be taken away, they can't be surrendered. You can no more take the human rights out of a man and have him live than you can take the heart out of a man and have him live. Unalienable rights, it says. Among these rights, the right to life. 
Even the founders knew that without that right, the other rights were sort of beside the point. The right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's why we are a shining city on a hill. But I understand why Americans may not be feeling like that today. A poll out last week, 60% of the country say that America is in decline. A shining city on a hill? In the Obama recession, the American people are lucky if they can turn the lights on in their house, let alone have a shining city on a hill. So nine years after 9-11, in the two weeks leading up to the anniversary, we had to sit there for two weeks and listen to elites, including the current occupant in the White House, make it clear to us that they were more interested in seeing a mosque built at ground zero than they were in describing and explaining to the American people the nature of the danger we face. And what is that danger? Let me remind you what the central reality of our age is. And it is going to be the central reality of our age, probably for the rest of our lifetime. And it boils down to this, that there are evil men who worship death, who are doing everything they can to bring to you and your families and to free men and women all over the world sorrows much greater than anything we have experienced up to now. They don't intend the next time to kill 3,000 of us or 30,000 of us. They intend to kill 300,000 of us. They will not rest until they see a nuclear cloud over Washington, D.C. or Jerusalem, over Berlin or over Paris. They are out to destroy Western civilization. Now, the president referred to them the other day as a sorry group of men. I, I hope he can come up with some better adjectives than that. And it's not a small group, ladies and gentlemen. It's not just al-Qaeda. The president keeps saying, well, we've got a problem with al-Qaeda. There's Hamas, there's Hezbollah, there's Islamic Jihad, there's the Taliban. And there are millions of people around the world that embrace the narrative that these murderers are using. That's why in the streets of major, major European uh, cities, we are seeing Jews beaten in the street. That's why Jewish cemeteries are being desecrated. And the hatred that inspires these acts is being taught in countless mosques, usually Saudi-funded, all over the Middle East and in Europe and right here in the United States. We've seen the handiwork of the people taught in these mosques. We watched Daniel Pearl, the Wall Street Journal reporter, kidnapped, tormented and tortured on videotape, made to look into the camera and say over and over again, I am a Jew, I am a Jew before they decapitated him and sent the video of his severed head across the Middle East as a recruiting tool. 